I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today's show is a special joint production of the University of the District of Columbia and the University of Cape Town. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa, where we'll be talking about expanding access to university education. Dr. Salim Badat is Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University in Grahamstown. He's the first CEO of the Council on Higher Education and is author of the book, The Forgotten People, Political Banishment Under Apartheid. Dr. Badat has a BA from the University of Natal, a certificate in higher education from Boston University, and a PhD in sociology from the University of York. Welcome, Dr. Badat. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for uh, making the time to come here. Our pleasure. Well, maybe if we could start by spending a little bit of time talking about where you want to take Rhodes University, where it's been, and your vision for the higher education sector in South Africa. Sure. Well, look, the first thing I think we must appreciate is Rhodes University is a 109-year-old institution, one of the oldest universities in South Africa and in Africa. But in our own nomenclature, it's also a historically white university. And I'm the first black vice chancellor in 104 years. So you confront a set of challenges at an institution that's uh, renowned for its educational excellence, but has many equity institutional culture issues uh, that it must confront, like many other universities, like Cape Town, Free State, and others have to confront. So I suppose my first uh, challenge really is how to make this university a home for all, having been a home largely for white South Africans uh, prior to 1994. And part of that is really to ensure that the culture of this university, whether it's academic, whether it's in terms of social, is one that's welcoming for all South Africans, black, white, people of different sexual orientation, irrespective of the languages you speak, the nationality you come from, and so on. But the danger, of course, is that you get focused only on the demographic issues, becoming more black, uh, more representative of the population. Uh, we don't have to become more women. We're already 59% women. But the danger there is then you start to uh, ignore important educational issues. Uh, what does this mean for curriculum? Does the curriculum speak to the South African experience? Or are we simply aping North America and Europe? as far as the curriculum experience of students is concerned and so on. So I suppose in a nutshell, um, transformation of Rhodes University and transformation is a big buzzword in South Africa and sometimes I think it's conceived of far too narrowly. Transformation really means thinking very deeply about what the purposes of a university is in South Africa, the roles that it must play which are similar to Harvard or Oxford or any other institution for that matter, and then really how it contributes to bringing about social change in South Africa. So, and this is not a, a hundred meter dash, this is a 10,000 kilometer race. And so you have to be uh, quite sure that in this process, in part of this race, you take everyone along with you. Institutions like universities are very fragile institutions. Too much change that isn't thought about carefully can destroy an institution. So you've got to be bold and you've got to be resolute about the kind of changes you want to bring about. But you've also got to be very careful about how you bring about those changes. And that's a fair point. In terms of how you bring about the change and in terms of the uh, transformation and in terms of the curriculum, what makes uh, the curriculum at uh, your university, at Rhodes University, different than Boston University or another university? Should it be different? Well, look, at one level, uh, it may not be different depending on disciplines. So one would hope that in engineering or in chemistry or in physics, you're teaching what's the state of the art. But when it comes to the humanities or the social sciences and those kinds of areas, perhaps even business, mm -hmm. one uh, must appreciate that universities are profoundly historical and cultural institutions. And what might be good for Harvard or Boston may not be appropriate for Rhodes and uh, for UCT. So I think you must be sensitive about the nature of the curriculum and how the curriculum speaks to your lived experiences in South Africa. So certainly some things will be common. Some of the theories that you may learn about, whether in the natural sciences or the social sciences and so on, will be common. But uh, once you accept that universities uh, are relating to a particular context and particular circumstances, you have to then ask the question of what does curriculum uh, 
do in this kind of situation? How does it speak to this live reality of South Africa, which is not the live reality of Sweden or Boston or California for that matter? And I think that's the most profound challenge facing South African universities. Ultimately, transformation is not simply about demographics. It's ultimately about, to use a big word, epistemological issues. What is knowledge? Whose knowledge uh, are we speaking about? How do we validate knowledge in a context where local knowledges have been despised? Why is it that if knowledge comes from the United States, it's considered knowledge? But if it comes from South Africa, it's considered to be indigenous knowledge. And that seems to me it betrays the lack of confidence on the part of our universities and on the part of our people. And so I think those are profound issues that our universities must grapple with at the same time as they grapple with how to make our institutions more representative, more women, more black, you know, and so on. So, so I think we, you know, we haven't really come to grips with these profound curriculum issues and knowledge issues uh, in the 20 years post-1994. But it seems that that would be more difficult in the social sciences than in the natural sciences. Exactly. Because in terms of history, whose history? Sure. I mean, that's obviously a powerful issue. Yeah. It, but in terms, of, in terms of today's present university, um, Rhodes University has the reputation, if I understand it, for attracting a lot of people from other parts of South Africa to Rhodes. Sure. But by definition, wouldn't that be people who can afford more tuition to pay? So isn't that going in the opposite direction sure. of what you might be trying to do in some ways? Well, look, when I joined Rhodes University in uh, 2006, uh, people did ask, uh, why are you joining that elitist university? And my response was, uh, it depends what you mean by elitism. If by elitism you mean that uh, the university constructs a high wall and keeps out people who don't have the financial means to come to Rhodes University, well, that's elitism. On the other hand, if the university approaches it in, the, in a framework which says, we would like to attract the best, the brightest, the students with the most potential and talent to Rhodes University, that's not elitism. Then the question really is how you raise the funds to ensure that the son or the daughter of a domestic worker or a farm worker has equal chances to come to Rhodes University as the son or the daughter of uh, the owner of one of the big corporations in South Africa. And that's something we've been working very hard at. So secondly, sometimes uh, you're accused of elitism because you do take seriously quality and the maintenance of certain standards. And so my own approach at Rhodes has really been to say our task, if you like, is equity with quality and quality with equity. I don't see any advantages in terms of compromising certain standards and quality. The graduates we've got to produce are graduates who must contribute to this country and must be able to engage with knowledge and technology and challenges globally, whether it's climate change, it's HIV, AIDS, and so on. So, Dumping down quality and standards is cynical. It suggests that we are becoming more equ equitable, but we're actually not becoming more equitable. So can we, com can we combine equity and quality? And I think that's a challenge, but I think it's quite possible. And then the question really is, how do we accommodate students in the South African context who have not had the luxury of going to private schools or the ex-model C schools? Uh, and that's the big problem of South African schooling. And then I think you have to work very hard to have alternative admissions uh, processes, have an admissions policy that recognizes merit on the one hand, but also recognizes hardships overcome, whether those hardships are economic, social, psychological, and so on. And I think increasingly we're moving in that direction. We want at Rhodes University not only the sons and daughters of the rich, whether they are black or white South Africans, I think that's a betrayal of democracy. We want anyone who has the potential and talent to realize uh, their ambitions and aspirations at Rhodes University, which means we must go out and find the funds and the scholarships and the bursaries to bring them to Rhodes University. Well, fair point. You know, I haven't been in South Africa physically for 20 years. So uh, some people have been jokingly calling this my Rip Van Winkle tour of South Africa, where uh, I'm seeing things that I didn't see before, but I'm also seeing a lot of things that were exactly the same 20 years sure. ago. I was in Kailicha the other day, 
And I don't mean to insult you or your countrymen, but it seemed very similar to what it seemed like 20 years ago. That's true. And I suspect that the schools weren't all that different from the way that they were 20 years ago. True. What is the responsibility of Rhodes or the University of Cape Town or any other university in South Africa to help to change that? Sure. Look, I think uh, universities historically and still today uh, play three fundamental roles. Firstly, we've got to produce graduates who can take their place in society, who can contribute to democratic citizenship, who can be productive citizens, who can contribute to uh, developing the South African economy and the economy of the continent. Secondly, our universities must produce knowledge so that we address the kind of challenges of our society, whether they're economic, political, or social. <clears throat> and thirdly, I think uh, in the South African context, community engagement, where institutions engage with communities, however we define them, to address the problems of our day, of being alive to the South African context of uh, unemployment, of poverty, of uh, a failing health system, a failing schooling system. Universities have to engage with those kinds of things. But you have to engage with them in a very uh, principled way. You cannot simply compensate for state failures. Universities are not development agencies themselves. They are universities. They have a particular role to play in our society. But at the same time, clearly you must be alive to the context in which we're playing that role. So certainly, University of Cape Town, Rhodes University, every university has the responsibility of asking the fundamental question, how do we make this a better society? How can the knowledge that we produce contribute to making that a better society? So I think we should be uh, ashamed uh, and you're quite right to say, as much as there have been certain discontinuities since 1994, and we can point to some of that, there are still many continuities, and a failing schooling system, people still living in shacks, high levels of unemployment, and so on, are very much manifestations of what hasn't changed in South Africa. And then there are some discontinuities that I think have become uh, more elaborated, like the corruption we find in this country. The press for everyone wanting to get rich as quickly as possible, and all the horrible manifestations of that in contemporary South Africa, and the way that impacts on the consciousness of youth and students about what it takes to make it in South Africa. So I think we've got severe challenges 20 years into our democracy, and hopefully next year we'll start to take some serious stock of what we've achieved in the 20 years. Do you teach an ethics course or ethics courses at Rhodes, or, or do universities here address issues of corruption in that way? Well, look, I'm very proud that Rhodes University was the first university, the first institution in South Africa that signed up to the Corruption Watch Pledge, not as an individual. I signed up as a vice chancellor, but I made it my responsibility to ensure that the entire university signed up to the Corruption Watch Pledge, and we became the first institution in South Africa to do that. And we did that publicly. And we renewed that commitment annually through an annual lecture on corruption. I think it's very important for universities, which in part function, if you like, or should function as a social conscience of society, to be playing leading roles in that kind of sphere of speaking quite boldly and bravely around issues of corruption and fraud and so on. And, and I'd like to think that, uh, you know, our contribution to ensuring people who are responsible and ethical leaders in our society, because ultimately universities do produce leaders or should be producing leaders in our society, that our commitment uh, to ethical leadership is not just a single course. Universities should be living themselves as ethical institutions. That's the best way to model behavior for your students not by simply a half an hour course in philosophy or in economics. From the top, from the vice chancellor, throughout the institution, you should be modeling the idea of ethics and ethical leadership, rather than just doing it at the level of coursework and so on. Fair enough. Do you, how do you liaise with other university presidents in South Africa and presidents and vice chancellors around the world? Well, look, we are, uh, brought together in Higher Education South Africa, which is the 23 universities, so we meet from time to time there. I interact quite a lot with my other uh, vice chancellors through 
the funding strategy group and the teaching and learning strategy groups, which are national strategy groups that I chair. I'm often invited to speak uh, at international conferences, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, on the social responsibilities of universities in uh, April. I'm invited by you know, various institutions. I spent three months in Berkeley last year on a sabbatical and visited other institutions, Oxford, um, Boston, and so on. So there's a lot of interaction, and there has to be a lot of interactions because universities really are global institutions today. And we need to be keeping our eyes and ears open about the kinds of changes that are happening in other parts of the world, what we may borrow in a critical way, not simply just aping what's happening elsewhere. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, contact amongst ourselves. Do you have an opinion about historically black institutions in the United States? Uh, the University of the District of Columbia, which hosts uh, our show, is a historically black university, and we have over 50 historically black uh, colleges and universities in the United States. Does that, how does that play in the South African context? Well, look, I think uh, it's possible that some experiences are uh, going to be similar between the historically black universities here and those in the United States. I would like to think uh, those two sets of institutions could be coming together to cooperate around particular issues. The, in South Africa, the historically black universities were originally established to play a certain role. They certainly were not uh, meant to be producing the engineers and the architects and the key leaders of our society. They were dealt a pretty bad hand in terms of resources, in terms of their very location in the rural areas and so on. And I'd like to think there's many issues that they could be coming together to speak about and think about and really in terms of setting out an agenda of how we might cooperate together to bring about some of the necessary changes uh, we would have to bring about in both those sets of institutions. So in the same way, and I think we mustn't uh, over-exaggerate uh, this, historically white universities in South Africa were also products of apartheid, as much as historically black were. So all these institutions have to be confronting the idea of how we become South African universities, having been historically black or historically white institutions. Well, fair enough. In terms of people getting to the universities, I'm struck by, and again, remember, I haven't physically been here sure. in 20 years, although I've studied a fair amount about South Africa, the distances in terms of how people get around in terms of transport, this is a very difficult issue because if students don't have cars and if they're in rural areas, it may take a ton of time for them to get to a, an institution. Well, look, this is a large country, and particular institutions have a sp special problems in that regard. Uh, we are fortunate as Rhodes University. we the most highly residential university in South Africa. Virtually one in two of our students stays in 51 residences. Majority of our students stay within, in fact, are required to stay within the 2.5-kilometer radius. So we don't experience the problem that perhaps uh, some rural institutions would or you know, some even urban institutions would. But yeah, in general, that's a challenge. And I think there's evidence that to the extent that people stay close to the university or they stay in the university residences, that does contribute to greater achievement on their part. If you're traveling uh, large and long distances each day, that's eating up into your studying time and so on. And it does affect uh, perhaps, you know, achievement of students in those universities. Well, in terms of your residence halls, if I can ask you about that a little bit, sure. because your uh, colleague, Jonathan Jansen, came on the show, and as you, I'm sure know, uh, the University of the Free State had some very difficult issues surrounding their residence halls. Sure. Have you done anything with your residence halls to make sure that there's been a kind of, I guess, peaceful residence halls, for lack of a better term? Well, look, again, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to think the kind of incident that happened at Free State would not easily happen at uh, Rhodes University. One of the things we take very seriously is uh, how we integrate our 51 residences. And they, they absolutely integrate it. Uh, you do not get a situation where a particular residence is majority white, majority black, or anything of that sort. And we're also very careful uh, because this is what sometimes unwittingly contributes to the domination of a particular historical social group. You know, we have lots of students whose parents and grandparents were at Rhodes University. Now, if you think about that, they're likely to be white. 
and they are very uh, fond of a particular residence where they stayed. And they often request their sons or daughters to go into those residences. And we engage with them very uh, sensitively and say, look, we'd love to do that. But if we were to proceed on that basis, what may actually happen is that residence would be largely white and others would be largely black. And that's not something we would like to see. And so, yes, we'll try and accommodate your, your son or your daughter, or your granddaughter, or your grandson in the very same residence that you were, but we cannot guarantee that. Once you engage sensitively to say why you are trying to uh, forge a different kind of uh, ethos and citizenship, people in get, you know, accept that kind of thing. So I think you've got to be very conscious about how you constitute your residences and not simply leave it to uh, histories and those kinds of things. Well, do you have the same problem with engaging with alumni? We, we call them alumni. Sure. Uh, people who went to those universities X, Y, or Z years ago. Yeah. Do, do you have the problem of engaging with alums, alumni in different ways sure. in terms of uh, maybe they want their grandkids to be admitted, maybe they want to donate something, sure. but there's a, uh, an unofficial quid pro quo? Sure. Well, look, I think, again, I've been very fortunate as vice chancellor. We haven't had some of the challenges that Afrikaans-speaking universities have had around language issues that have really torn apart alumni. We haven't had the challenges uh, around the residence issues and so on. Um, perhaps Rhodes University is slightly different in that sense. We've got a very strong and loyal, we think the most loyal alumni base in South Africa, and that certainly manifests itself in terms of they are wonderful ambassadors and so on. But I think, again, I think the, fa uh, the, the key principle is don't take your alumni for granted. They are not just there for you to ask money from. I think you've got to keep them informed all the time about the direction in which you're taking the university engage with them through appropriate structures and so on, buy their support for the new direction. And I think if you do that, if you put in the hours uh, making that effort, they generally become very supportive. So we're fortunate. We haven't had the problems other universities have had. And you have a, um, you have a, um, a, a Rhodes University trust in the United States, if I'm That's not right. mistaken. How does that work exactly? Well, Rose University Trust was really uh, established in the USA and the UK to uh, help us uh, raise uh, funds from our alumni, from other donors. Uh, we have very committed people. Uh, we don't have anyone full time. We simply have volunteers who help us. I go off to the United States at least once every two years to meet with the big foundations, Ford, Carnegie, Mellon, Rockefeller and others but also meet uh, alumni, meet the ambassador, the consul general, and really uh, say to them what our priorities are for the next few years, what new building we are trying to construct, and seek their support. And that, that works fairly well. Do you have any ties, institutional ties, with any educational institutions in the US? Absolutely. We have uh, very close ties with Boston College in Boston. The uh, students come to us, our students go to them, and a couple other universities. So we are constantly forging ties to uh, make Rhodes a much more cosmopolitan place. Uh, it's a secret, uh, not very well known. 23% of our undergraduate students are from other countries outside of South Africa. This year we have 66 countries represented at Rhodes University. 28% of our students are international students at postgraduate level. We value international students uh, because it does something for the culture of our institution. But it also means that our undergraduates or postgraduates are forging networks from people around the world. So that's something we really value, having international students. Well, I think that's important. And, and a lot of universities are, of course, moving in that exact direction. But if, if we can get to Boston College for a second, if, if a Boston College undergraduate student wanted to come to Rhodes, does he or she have to pay different tuition, or they simply pay the tuition to Boston College, and then you recognize that? Well, uh, we're one of the few countries in the world, and I'm very proud to say that, and certainly Rhodes University charges the same fees for students from the rest of uh, Africa and the rest of the world as our local students. What we do charge is a small levy, uh, and it's a modest levy. 50% of that levy goes to support other international students on scholarships and bursaries. 25% more or less goes to our international office. Other 25% is absorbed in our budgets. So for the moment, and I hope uh, this uh, remains the case, we have not gone the route where we're seeing international students as a very nice way to top up your finances. 
And as you well know, um, that's the case in a number of institutions. Sure. But that's that's good. That, but on the other hand, you can see the other side of that, where if you're not charging if you're not charging the extra fees for those students, then essentially the money has to come from somewhere else. Well, look, we've got a situation in this country where not only do we not charge top-up fees, as they call in the United States and the uh, UK, the South African government provides you a subsidy for each student and does not distinguish between international students and local students. So the 23% undergraduate students at Rhodes, we get a subsidy for every one of those students. Now that, uh, you may argue, is incredible generosity on the part of a, a developing society. And I think that's something we can be proud of. I think that's the real spirit of internationalism in higher education, rather than seeing students from other countries as a way of really making money, which unfortunately is what's happening in too many institutions around the world today. Well, fair enough. In terms of uh, money and time, we've only got another minute or so. Is sure. there any last-minute message you'd like to leave with viewers in the United States who may be seeing this and may be learning about Rhodes for the first time? Sure. Look, I would simply encourage uh, partnerships between South African universities and uh, U.S. institutions. I think in as much as we have a lot to benefit from those partnerships, I'd like to think U.S. institutions will benefit incredibly from those partnerships with South African universities. And especially I would like to think in the social sciences and humanities, this is a laboratory, but not just in those areas. We will be building the biggest telescope in the world. We won the right to do that with our square kilometer array. And I would like to think that uh, many students and academics from those institutions would want to partner our institutions that are at the forefront of what's going to be uh, science looking back to when the Earth began. So I think there are wonderful opportunities for collaboration. Well, we look forward to that. Sure. If you would like additional information about Dr. Badat, please visit ru.ac.za. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.